this program, our annual program of the Institute for Spiritual Culture. So first of all, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Thank you for showing some interest in our topic of discover the glories of our mothers. So maybe for those of you who are attending our program for the first time, let me share a little bit of background information. So it is exactly five years ago that we inaugurated this little institute for spiritual culture. It was also two days after the last Maha Abhishek, actually. I remember distinctly. And the inspiration for this institute for spiritual culture I had because for the last 20 years I have been very much involved in the preaching in Bangladesh. And for those of you who are not so familiar with Bangladesh, it's actually not very far from here. It's just one and a half hours drive and you come to the Bangladeshi border. And Bangladesh is a very unique place. It is East Bengal. It is the place where most of Mahaprabhu's associates come from like Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Pundarik Vidyanidhi, even Mahaprabhu's parents, Jagannath Mishra, Sachi Mata, they come from East Bengal, which is now Bangladesh. So many more actually, even, um, yes, even Madhavendra Puri, Mukunda Datta, Vasudev Datta, so many personalities come from that part of Bengal. And Ironically, because it is a Muslim country, this actually has preserved our Vaishnav culture immensely. Because the Muslims are not so fond of all the modern um, ideas. So th that has kept our Vaishnav culture so alive. And, you know, over the last 20 years, I have been spending considerable time there traveling with the devotees, preaching with them, living with them. When I'm there, I'm only with locals. There's no Western devotees living there. And over the last 20 years, I have received such um, transformational insights, actually, and which have deep has deeply affected my personal spiritual practice, and of course also my preaching. And I could almost say my whole worldview was put upside down, actually, <laughs> of how civilized cultures, human life is meant to be lived. And yeah, so I th started thinking, you know, not everybody can go to Bangladesh. So that's why I felt the need for some systematic training and education in this topic of culture. And that's why I thought, all right, let me establish a little institute for spiritual culture. And I developed all kinds of courses, six courses actually. They quite naturally grew over the years. And for example, one course is on the Vanapasta Ashram. There's nobody even talking much about it. Then one course about the need for sheltering relationships. One course about family life as an ashram. One course about child raising. One course about the man-woman dynamics. One course about the false ego. The false ego, our constant companion and troublemaker. So many topics which are all very much connected with this topic of culture. So this little institute of spiritual culture it is basically an educational institution within the institution of ISKCON. Like last week we had an international conference for education and there are so many, um, so many initiatives um, were presented which are all di um, directed towards one aspect of education. So and in the same way um, my humble attempt is to bring attention to this topic of culture. And since the last five years, since this inauguration, every year we have this annual program 
which is like a symposium type program where I'm setting a theme and I'm inviting different speakers and um, yes, just to bring attention to the importance of culture because um, we can say our education at this point is often directed very much towards Shastric education. We like to learn our philosophy, memorize verses, preach them, repeat them. But that's step number one, according to my humble understanding. But the step number two is to actually live accordingly. That's a challenge. Yes, that's not so easy, actually. And especially these days, that materialistic propaganda which we are surrounded by is so strong and the, the conditioning is so subtle and deep it is not so easy to transform this, actually. And let me let me mention a few um, little uh, points about culture. Let us first of all understand how does culture develop? How does it come about? It actually comes about by practically living a certain worldview, a certain philosophy, a certain ideology. By practically living it, all different aspects of the culture develop in practical life. So, and there's only two main cultures in this world, materialistic culture, spiritual culture. And in Bhagavad Gita 269, Krishna says what is day to the common person is night to the introspective sage and vice versa. So that gives us some understanding that these two cultures are indeed like day and night because they're based on very different worldviews. In a nutshell, materialistic culture is all about sense enjoyment and all about feeding the ego actually, putting a lot of emphasis on bodily identification, gross and subtle. It's all about becoming an important, big important person. That's what material life is all about, showing off. One can almost say the more expert we become in showing off, the more successful one becomes in material life, right? And the media, Facebook, all these things, they're immensely helping in that um, endeavor to somehow become prominent and known and, and, and. But Spiritual life is based on the opposite worldview. There we want to minimize and reduce sense gratification and ultimately give up the taste for it, replace it with a higher um, taste. And we want to understand we are tiny insignificant. We want to dissolve the subtle body and bodily concept of life. We want to dissolve the false ego. We become tiny and insignificant humble servant. So these two worldviews are like day and night, actually. And we can imagine one end is the day of the materialist, other end is day of spiritualist. And in between is a broad spectrum of all kinds of mixtures and shades and grades. And spiritual life, devotional service, is actually meant to bring about this transformation, that the day of the materialist eventually becomes our night. That's actually what Krishna consciousness is meant to bring about. We are meant to transform our tastes, our likes and dislikes, our worldviews, our patterns of behaviors are very hard. Otherwise, how can we develop bhakti in that heart, right? So, but this transformation cannot be imposed and forced on people. It can only be inspired. Yes. Everybody has to do that internal work at their own pace and so on. And maybe not everybody even wants to transform. But in any case, I simply want to share these points to set a foundation to every further discussion. Because even the topic of mother, we will hopefully 
get some insights in due course tonight that in spiritual life and its culture, mothers play a super important role. They're very, very important mothers of all levels. As we know, we have Krishna gives us seven mothers. Whereas in material life, nobody even talks about the importance of mothers. This is not really a topic. Yeah, right? Except for Mother's Day. And even then, it's mainly a commercial interest. Let's be honest here. You know? <laughs> Yeah, so much just as a little introduction. Let us invite as first speak Holiness Krishna Kshetra Swami Maharaj. And he will enlighten us on the, on the seven mothers. He will introduce the seven mothers overall as an overall presentation. And then we will we will narrow it down. The next speaker will have three mothers, and then we will go down to one mother, like that. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin iti namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nivishesha Shunyavali Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpatrum Yascha Kripa Sindhu Vya Evacha Patitana Pavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare First, I'd like to convey my thanks to Mother Devaki for inviting me to speak. It's interesting, we have this uh, expression, Mata Ji, and oddly, this expression has been interpreted by some devotees as a pejorative term, as a negative term, although it's it's not negative. Mata means mother. G is a suffix of respect. It's an honorific in uh, Odish, Odish in language. Uh, I believe it's Gu, and in ba um, Rajabasa it would be Ju. So Mata G is is honorific respect. It's, re it's showing respect. Uh, recently I was in the Delhi area and sometimes I was overhearing um, devotee ladies speaking to or referring to other devotee ladies as Mataji. And I thought that's interesting. These are Hindi-speaking ladies. Um, and for them, it's not a problem. <laughs> it's, it's proper, it's appropriate. In any case. So my, my subject is seven mothers. I've made some notes. And um, just some food for thought as we reflect on, on motherhood. First, though, let me ask, um, do we have some mothers amongst us? That is, parents of children. Good. <clears throat> and do we have uh, devotees who have have or have had, your mother might not be alive, but who have had mothers or have mothers? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> and yet, this is the point we tend to forget. Uh, to not appreciate. 
So it is stated uh, in at least one verse. I was looking for this verse. What is the source? Srila Prabhupada refers to it, um, but doesn't give the source. And it took me quite some time to find it. Uh, it it's it's a what is called subhasita, uh, which means it's a saying. It's a a good saying, literally subhasita. Uh, that's as far as I've been able to trace it. But it. It lists seven mothers, our own mother, of course, then the nurse, then the wife of the guru, the wife of a brahmin, the queen, the earth, and the cow. What are all of these personalities and persons and entities have in common? Uh, this is the idea of the verse. They are all mother which suggests that the idea of mother is expanded beyond our normal conception of mother as um, biological mother, that is, referring to six. So, what I want to suggest in the next few minutes is, since we have this tradition of identifying seven mothers, uh, this, the, the, the aggregate, so to say, all of these mothers together can help us to appreciate in multiple ways um, how we are dependent beings and are, as such, benefited um, by our mothers, most importantly, of course, and most immediately, our Bi biological mothers. And speaking of our biological mother, we all have something on our bodies that remind us of our connection and dependence on our mother, and it's called in English the navel. So every time you're in the shower and you're cleaning yourself and you're cleaning your <laughs> your tummy, your stomach. <laughs> you can be reminded, oh yes, <laughs> I, uh, I have had a connection. This connection was, of course, uh, ended at the time of our birth. And that's something of an irony, considering that our dependence on our mothers continues for quite some years. It's an unusual um, possibly unique feature of human species, uh, our dependence over such a long period of our lives. Our own mothers are, we can say, the embodiment of uh, vatsalya rasa, if we're thinking in terms of relationship. Uh, which is developed in our bhakti tradition in terms of the aesthetics of rasa, what is called rasa theory. Then we have what is called vatsalya rasa. And the word vatsalya comes from vatsa, which means calf, as in baby cow. So that, that leads us uh, to the subject of cow as mother. But that's getting ahead of myself. Um, but it's good to keep this in mind that this relationship with the mother is one of vatsalya and um, we generally understand vatsalya as the, f the feeling of the parent toward the child but Srila Prabhupada explains in a purport in 7th canto it can be the other way around as well He's speaking in terms of father and son. He's speaking about Prahlad and his father. Uh, but uh, his father, <laughs> Hare Krishna. But the point is just that the relationship is uh, going in both, both directions, Vatsalya. But what's uh, a general sense, I think, in a perhaps too theoretical uh, expression, but still, I like to say that our mother is 
the matrix of our very existence. And of course, the word matrix is uh, coming uh, from the idea of casting. When you make a metal casting, say you want to cast uh, a, a bronze bell, uh, you first make the matrix which is going to receive uh, the molten metal. And then when the metal is poured in and cools, you break the mold and then you have the, the bell. So the mother, we don't break the mother, but in a sense, <laughs> because of the sacrifice she is making, she is also functioning in a similar way, giving her life uh, for the child. And so she is the, the matrix of our existence. The nurse. As we all know, Krishna, this is an example given um, in the Bhagavatam, but identified by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur as a demonstration of the mercy <coughs> of Krishna, the perfection of mercy of Krishna, that he considers Putana, who has come to kill Krishna, as his nurse. And why does he consider Putana as his nurse? Because she has offered her breast milk to him. The nurse is a kind of assistant to the biological mother, and I think we say wet nurse. Uh, so she will have a very close relationship uh, with the child, which is very similar to that of the mother, but is different from the mother. It's still a giving and supporting relationship uh, in which, because the of the child's uh, utter dependency, her position is highly responsible, and she is entrusted by the mother uh, to give that assistance. Lebegating datu chitam tatoyam kamva dayalum sharanam rajema datri. She is regarded as datri. So the example is Krishna. Uh, Krishna seeing even. Uh, Putana as his nurse, and thus when she's uh, killed, she becomes Krishna's nurse. The wife of the guru. The guru is giving education to the child. The child is still in a position of uh, great vulnerability, and the wife of the guru, because the tradition uh, was that Guru would be a Grihasta, and as a Grihasta, he has his family, and the wife is assisting him, and in particular, he is, she is assisting in the support of, we may say, the material needs of the child, and thus, she is supporting the education of the child, and I think a, a relevant <coughs> um, corollary, if you like, to this is the degree of, en of education of one's own mother will have much to say, it'll have a significant influence determining the education of the child. So to say that women should not be educated all they should do is stay at home and raise their children. I would question this, because the, the first educator of the child is the mother. So if the mother is educated nicely, she can foster the, the child's education from a very early time. And we have seen this um, demonstrated with um, some of the devotees I've met from the second, even third generation there, uh, 
And because the mother is caring so much for the education of the child, because she is educated, the children grow up um, and become very, very well educated. Mm. I can speak for myself to some extent uh, in this regard. My, my mother was uh, a talented musician. Uh, she played uh, piano, she played uh, church organ, and she was also teaching. Uh, since I can remember, she was teaching piano. Uh, and she was teaching piano to myself and to my brother uh, from age five. We were we were learning. I revolted at age nine. That's why I can't play piano now, but I can play harmonium. But uh, she was also teaching the neighborhood children. And this, for me, was also uh, significant. She was, in this way, also we may say publicly conscious. She was uh, concerned for the community and uh, it made for a very nice community spirit. Children from the uh, neighborhood were coming, they were learning, and then there would be recitals, so all the children would come and their parents. Uh, so this was nice. Also, my mother uh, was quite religious uh, from her Christian tradition, and um, from that, uh, from her own culture, uh, she was an avid reader of her scriptures, the Bible and related literature, and she would begin her study every day at five o'clock in the morning. Um, and this had an impression on me such that when I met the devotees and they t told me we start at 4.30 in the morning with our morning program, okay, no problem. <laughs> that made perfect sense to me. The wife of a Brahmin Here I was thinking how in a, we may consider the wife of the Brahmin as being the mother of all of the Varnas. She is a kind of sustainer or maintainer or stabilizer of the Varna system, the social order in general. Uh, and because of this, she is an, uh, a very important influence for maintaining peace in society. Uh, the, the, the other Varnas are looking to the Brahmins uh, for stability, but behind, behind the male, behind every good male householder Brahmin is a good, stable householder woman, wife, who is probably also a mother. And so this principle of stability of society is very much uh, sustained through the wives of the Brahmins. Of course, in general, the Brahmins, husband and wife, are supposed to be models uh, of family order and stability for the rest of society. And we all work on the basis of models. Yat yat acharati sheshtas tat tat evitarojana. So, we, we look to others as models from, very er from day one, really, uh, and it continues through life. So, if there are good examples of Brahminical marriage, then uh, the wife of the Brahmin marriage, husband and wife, the wife becomes a mother to the society as a whole. Well, speaking of society as a whole, what about the queen, who is, of course, the wife of the Kshatriya? She is also identified as a mother. And here, I would suggest that 
the queen is the source of energy and inspiration for the kshatriya ruler. She is, she is the power behind the powerful, <laughs> if you like. I was thinking about this earlier today in the game of chess. Who knows how to play chess? So those of you who play chess, or have, have, you might not admit it now, but <coughs> you may have played chess. You know the queen is the most powerful figure on the chessboard. She has the most diversity of movement. Very she's the most powerful of all. Why is that? <laughs> because she is the power behind the powerful. Or she is, anyway, it's, it's Shakti Shakti Man. And the position of the king is one of power. The, the, the king is a power broker. He is concerned with uh, gaining power, sustaining power, holding and, and managing power. That's his main business. But also the king, the king's business is um, disseminating justice. And sometimes he goes overboard. And therefore, the queen is there to soften, to balance, to bring in the, the element of mercy. There's, just, there's need for justice and there's need for mercy. Just like Draupadi. When Ashvatthama was being judged, Krishna was saying, Krishna is the, the male, in this case, the Kshatriya saying, telling Arjuna, kill him. Draupadi is saying, don't kill him. His mother has suffered enough. She, she shouldn't have to suffer. So she's showing the, the heart uh, of the queen. And that becomes essential for, again, the, the sustaining of society as a whole. Well, the, the queen is also, um, by supporting the king, um, his duty is, of course, to protect the earth. And what is the earth, or rather, who is the earth? The earth is Dharani, she who holds, she who keeps us all from going into the netherworld, and she is another mother. Dharani, the earth, accepts, she is receiving the weight, uh, the burden of all creatures. She's receiving the burden of all creatures and she is giving, and what is she giving? Her produce. And in the Bhagavatam, the story of Prithu Maharaj, uh, his interaction with, um, with Bhumi, she is giving as a cow her milk. Her, her bounty is uh, regarded as her milk, which she gives to different sorts of creatures depending on their particular needs and preferences. But uh, always she is giving her, her bounty unless and until humans are abusing her bounty, which is what is happening today. And then what does she do? She withholds. She holds back her bounty. So it said, Earth is the mother of all beings. And because we are disregarding this identification of Earth as mother, we are abusing Mother Earth, forgetting that she is mother and thinking Earth is to be exploited. And so we have, um, we have what is called extraction economy. Uh, we are extracting from the earth. And this extraction economy is getting us into deep trouble. 
And this then is showing our disrespect for motherhood in general. That mothers, our biological mother and respect for her is very closely related to our respect or disrespect for Mother Earth. If we get both of these right, if we get one right, we can get the other right and vice versa. If not, then we have trouble. Finally, we have Mother Cow. In my research on cow protection uh, in recent months, I've met several people uh, who are very dedicated in cow uh, protection. And they all refer to cow as Gomata, mother cow. And I ask them, what about bull? And they say, all are Gomata. They're either Gomata directly or Gomata, they are the offspring of Gomata. In any case, they're all Gomata. Cows, bulls, they're all Gomata. <laughs> and of course, in the Bhagavatam, the cow is identified with earth, and interestingly, uh, she speaks. And what she speaks about is her vulnerability, her helplessness. So on the one side we have mother who is protecting child, giving, nourishing child, and then on the other hand we have mother as the um, as as the recipient uh, recipient of protection because of her vulnerability and and so the task in understanding appreciating motherhood needs to see both sides of this the mother is giving benefit the mother is also in position of need and that is especially found in the case of cow. I just interviewed one devotee in Vrindavan uh, who keeps cows since many years. He said, taking care of cows is a 24-7 service. It's, all, it's constant endeavor. So we might say also taking care of children is 24-7, but also taking care of mothers. <laughs> Proper care, uh, this is also 24-7. Uh, so here we have it, seven different sorts of mother from whom, t I would say collectively, we get a very rich understanding of what actually uh, motherhood is about and how how essential uh, it is for us to properly honor Hare Krishna. What would you say is the most important quality for a mother to provide this stability which you were mentioning? Uh -huh. um, Well, as, as Vaishnavas, we, we, we might want to immediately say the quality is steadiness of sadhana. <laughs> uh, certainly, the principle of tolerance is very important. Mothers, I remember also from my childhood, uh, we lived in a, um, how do you say, apartment row, so there were um, there were, th anyway, the apartment next, next to us, the walls were somewhat thin, and, and sometimes uh, the mother, the wife of the family next door could be heard <laughs> um, having a real tantrum. I mean, really like cutting loose with I don't. I think she was shouting at her husband, and I felt really sorry for the husband, and for the children. And well, I have to say that was the beginning. I was maybe eight years old or less. That was the beginning of my questioning whether I, myself, wanted to be getting involved in family life. <laughs> Although my own family was completely different, my mother was very. Uh, 
very quiet, very yeah, stable, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, a culture of tolerance would certainly need to be there. Also, mothers need uh, a stable economic situation. If they're not, if if the economic situation is not stable, they're going to be disturbed. And if they're disturbed, then that will be reflected on the family. So it's um, it's unfortunate when we we sometimes see a, a marriage uh, of which is uh, which takes place before economic stability is established by the by the by the husband and this uh, i've read also this is uh, high in the statistics of reasons why marriages break up because of economic instability as next speaker i would like to um, invite her grace rukmini davy dasi she joined at very young age. Is it true, Madhuji, that you joined when you were 16? Yes, amazing. In 1968. And yes, she served as Pujari in different places, Boston, New York, LA. She spent two years in, in India learning how to make these dolls from clay for the dioramas. And then she was 25 years running a business with her husband. Actually, she is the wife of Anuttama Prabhu, wife and better half of Anuttama Prabhu. I think we all know him. He's a um, GBC. So he's also the Minister for Communication, a very powerful preacher, wonderful personality. So she is his better half. So they were together running a business for 25 years. Now she is a board member of various boards, also here of the Saba Advisory Group and so many other boards. And she travels internationally, takes part in conferences and retreats and, and, and. So she has a very active life of really service and dedication to Shri Prabhupada's mission, what can I say? <laughs> And also, she has one son, Guravani, famous Kirtanir, and three grandchildren. So, mother on all different levels. Mm -hmm. So, she will share some insights and realizations. Now, we are kind of boiling down things. She will speak on the, on the wife of Brahmana, guru or teacher, king or leader, manager, because she's actually in that position. She is the wife of a brahmana and a leader and a teacher. <laughs> so we want to hear from, hear from her some realizations and insights on this. Thank you. Thank you. Om Gyananjana Salakaya Jaksun Militam Yena does my she Gurave Namaha Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasate Deve Goravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sanyavari Paschatya De Shatarine I'm very grateful to Devaki for inviting me to speak. Srila Prabhupada said that every year we should come to Mayapur to discuss the idea of unity and diversity. So her in invitation to me is actually a beautiful example of that because um, perhaps I come from a slightly different perspective from, from hers and still she has honored me to speak here, so I'm very grateful for that. So, yes, the Manusmriti talks about how the gods dwell where women are honored and respected. And, and first of all, our own mother, our first guru, the one who gave us birth. Srila Prabhupada says in his purport to Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 16th chapter, verses 26 through 30, 
he says that only fools are ungrateful to their benefactors. Isn't that powerful? So we don't think so much of gratitude in Krishna consciousness, but if you keep an eye out, you'll find Srila Prabhupada references the word gratitude very, very often in his purports. And it's a really, really important concept, especially when thinking of our, our mothers or really when thinking of anything. So, yeah. So maybe you may have issues with your birth mother. Many of us do. But thank her. Be grateful. She didn't abort you. She didn't throw you in a trash bin. Thank her. I was in New Jersey once, and I don't know if you'll believe this, but it's true. I was in New Jersey, in Newark, New Jersey, and there was, I saw this uh, advertisement. Have you seen this? It was on the side of a bus, and it said, don't throw your baby in the dumpster. A dumpster is a big trash bin in, the, in America. Don't throw your baby in the dumpster. If you have a baby and you don't want the baby, just bring the baby to the nearest police station or fire station, and we won't ask any questions, but we'll take your baby. No questions asked. But just don't throw the baby in the dumpster. So, certainly Kali Yuga, isn't it? When a mother is so destitute in her consciousness that she could throw her own baby in the trash. How sad. So your mother raised you. She taught you to the best of her ability the difference between good and bad. She tolerated your teenage rebellion, perhaps. I know my mother and father tolerated that I joined the ISKCON movement when I was 16 years old. <laughs> so thank you, Mom. <laughs> thank you. So, and, and then ladies, some often ladies are looking for a good husband. And my advice to you ladies is that marry a man who loves and respects his own mother. Maharaj was just speaking so beautifully and, and probably if you interviewed a lot of leading um, men in this kind, you would find that they had amazing relationships with their mothers very often. So otherwise, there will be, when there are difficulties, and there are always difficulties in life, he may just take it out on you. So believe me, that um, marry a man who loves and respects his mother. And Devaki Devi is concerned that ladies don't try to compete with the men. And I, I would agree with that. Srila Prabhupada said that men have a broad shoulder mentality. So in a relationship, in a marriage, only one person can really be the boss. So best to let him be the boss. It's more peaceful and it's more natural that way. But as women, as Vaishnavis, we have our own gifts, and I believe in that. So actually, I, I was invited to speak in Varanasi at a conference. I'm leaving in a couple of days. It's a conference on Sita Devi. And I was invited to speak on awakening the higher masculine and feminine energies. So as Maharaj said again, uh, in Bhakti, we are worshipers of the Shakti Shakti Man, the Prakriti Purusha. Krishna is never separated from his Daivi Prakriti, his divine energy. We always honor the feminine pleasure potency of the Lord first. It's always Radha Krishna, Sita Ram, and Lakshmi Narayan. So in divinity, as in nature, there are always these two energies. And they're meant to exist in balance and in harmony. And, and that is bhakti, an existence in balance and harmony. There's a, a beautiful story about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, that a very a arrogant man came to him and he said, I have seen God. I have seen Krishna. And in, in humility and almost like a, an innocence, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, oh, and did you see his energy? Which is it's just so, so charming that Krishna's never separated from his energy. So if you've actually seen Krishna, you would have also seen his energy. A number of years ago, Jayadvaita Swami said something very wise. Any of you know Jayadvaita Swami? He has an acidic sense of humor. So he said something very wise. He said, the trouble with ISKCON, he made a wise observation, the trouble with ISKCON is that we have no grandmothers. 
<laughs> that was a number of years ago. So what he was saying really is, and it's true in a sense, we had no common sense that the only granny wisdom, granny wisdom, I think Allen Ginsberg said that. So the only granny wisdom we had was from Srila Prabhupada. He was really kind of the only grandmother. and He was the only one we would listen to, the only one we would accept. So of course now we do have many grandmothers in ISKCON. But the problem is when the voices of women, when the voices of mothers or grandmothers are silenced, it opens the door for women and children and women themselves to be abused. As we've so sadly seen with our children and our God sisters seen them suffer, women and children need to be protected, as Srila Prabhupada always says. So protected from whom? Protected from evil spirited men, right? The would-be abusers that we're seeing all over the world in the Me Too movement. So I wanted to read you a short excerpt from something Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur wrote many years ago, maybe in the t 1920s, maybe in the early 30s. But he wrote this in his Harmonist uh, newspaper. I find this very egalitarian and, and, and an amazing. Um, it's just a little excerpt from the piece. But he says, men and women are joined in wedlock for the purpose of serving each other in the joint service of Krishna. The wife is not an object of enjoyment of the husband, nor vice versa. They choose for their partners only such persons who serve God better than themselves. They offer themselves to be accepted by their partners for the favor of being allowed to share in their superior service of Hari. Isn't that beautiful? It's just a little clip from a, a longer piece, but I, I find it very powerful. So what about the wife of the teacher or the guru? I was thinking about the ideal gurukula, the gurukula of Sandipani Muni. And we can only surmise that, thank you, that the wife of Sandipani Muni must have been there to lovingly care for Krishna, Balaram, and little Sudama Brahmana. You know, what a beautiful image of that family guru with his loving wife and the children receiving care. Maybe she would be bathing them and it's a beautiful ideal. But generally in the past, our children, our children didn't have that kind of a, a mother's love in, in Gurukula. But I think it is much better now by Krishna's grace. So generally the most glorious service for a woman really is to be a wife and a mother. It's the most centering and most deeply fulfilling role that a, that a woman can have in life. But there are, and always have been, and always will be, different kinds of people. And this is not only a function of modernity. The earliest Upanishads describe that in the Treta Yuga, an erudite woman scholar named Gargi debated the sage Yagyavalka in the court of King Janaka. So we all have different gifts given to us by God. Just like Devaki herself, she's preaching all over the world according to her own understanding and realization. So what we are given is God's gift to us and how we use it is the gift we give back to God. Gauravani and I have some very close friends in Mumbai and the family, they're really pillars of the community there. And their older daughter is very, very happy being a wife and a mother of three beautiful daughters. And her younger sister, from the time she was very small, has always known that she wanted to grow up to be the Prime Minister of India. And she is now, currently she is an attorney, she's working in a law firm, and she wants to be the change, as Gandhi said. She wants to be the change. She intends to be the change. And she has every intention for political office. So our sons, our daughters may not fit the mold of what you or I think they should do in life. Actually, I just want to inject a little joke here. My son Gauravani has a joke. He says that every mother in ISKCON is saying to her son, you know, you, maybe you've all heard of um, Radhika Raman Prabhu or Ravi Gupta who got a PhD at Oxford at the age of like 20, 22, I don't know. 
like the youngest in the history of Oxford. So Gauravani says that every mother in ISKCON is saying to her son, you bum, why aren't you Ravi Gupta? <laughs> That's a joke. So, so I believe that true Varnashram would be when everyone finds a place to serve in Srila Prabhupada's greater ISKCON society, where everyone would be honored for their unique contribution. If only 10% of the people become top brahmacharis in ISKCON, then true Varnashram would be to have wonderful, inspiring programs for the other 90%. Perhaps you've all heard about the first Hindu congresswoman representative, Tulsi Gabbard. So she is a Vaishnava. And every year on New Year's Day, she goes online and reads an ins ins inspirational message from Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is to share uplifting wisdom with, from Srila Prabhupada with the public at large. So in, we live in Washington, D.C., and in Washington we were at an, ev an event honoring her election, and we met her parents who are also devotees. So her mother was telling me that both her daughters are warriors, and both her sons are doing business. And Tulsi, who is now running for president of the US, was once a soldier in Iraq, carrying a machine gun, and she is a devout follower of Srila Prabhupada. So each one of us is like a snowflake. Each one of us is unique with, a di with different gifts from Krishna, meant to be used for him in our own unique ways. If I don't offer my unique God-given gifts back to Krishna, then the world will be that much less. Mother Teresa said something very beautiful. She said, we sisters of charity feel that what we are doing is just simply dr tiny drops in the ocean. But then she said, but without our tiny drops, the ocean would be that much less. Isn't that beautiful? I find that so beautiful. So what about the wife of a king? I often think about the great Kunti Devi. She was the queen. She was a pure devotee of Lord Krishna. She had the right to approach Krishna's chariot as he was leaving Hastinapur to go back to his own city of Dwarka. But what if she had stood at the back? What if she had not come forward to offer her extraordinary prayers? Then the world would have been bereft of hearing her meditation, her words of glorification, and learning from her exemplary devotion. Srila Prabhupada would sing her prayers in times of difficulty. At Bhaktivedanta Hospital in Mumbai, when someone is wheeled into surgery and given anesthetic, the last thing they hear is the prayers of Mother Kunti. And what about the wife of a Brahmana? I think of the yag Yagyapatnis. They are our mothers and our gurus of pure devotion. Their husbands knew all the mantras and tantras and yantras, but they, what they did not know was that when Krishna and Balaram and the cowherd boys are in the neighborhood and they are hungry, that they should immediately be given the results of sacrifice. Bhaktaram yagya tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram suridam sarva bhutanam gyatvamam shantim richchiti. So, but the simple, illiterate wives of those Brahmins knew what their highly educated husbands did not know, that Krishna is the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the well-wishing friend of all living beings. The wives of the brahmanas had that conviction and peace. They were not afraid to go to Krishna with their offerings. And their husbands cursed themselves afterwards, to hell with our yagyas and mantras and tantras, we were so ignorant that we did not take the opportunity to serve Krishna the way our wives did. The beautiful Bhagavatam is all about this kind of role reversal. It's all about uplifting the small people, the humble people, like Prahlad Maharaj, like Sudama Brahmana, like the simple gopis of Vrindavan. And what about Mother Cow? She is the emblem of selfless love, eating only grass which grows freely everywhere, transforming it into her own life's blood, giving us the miracle food of milk, like our own mother's milk, 
milk and ghee and all that's used in the worship of Krishna and building finer brain tissues so we can understand Krishna. She is our gentle mother. And just seeing her calms the mind. Yet in the dark days of Kali Yuga, like other mothers, she is being abused and killed. And the nurse, maybe we don't have a nurse who helped our natural mother feed us, but what about Lord Vishwambara? Amba means the nurse. Lord Goranga, Lord Vishwambara. He is the universal mother who is feeding us the nectar of the holy name of Krishna. If we will only agree to drink deeply knowing that there is no other reality within all the 14 worlds, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur said. And finally, the sacred goddess who holds us all, each and every day, our Mother Earth. Her gifts are not a commodity or even a resource to be misused out of greed. And where is our gratitude for the gifts with, with which she nourishes us all every day? Without gratitude, love is impossible. We talk a lot about higher uh, rasas of love in, in Krishna consciousness, but without gratitude, love is really impossible. Do you all know the prayer to Mother Earth that in our bhakti tradition we're instructed to say every morning before rising from bed? Maybe some of you know that prayer. Samudra vasane devi parvatastana mandite vishnu patni namastu bhyam parasparsham samasvame. Oh, Mother Earth, you are holding the oceans and the mountains. You are the wife of Vishnu. Please forgive me for placing my feet on you. So before putting your foot on the floor each morning, this is the prayer we're supposed to say. So in conclusion, wisdom on the path of bhakti is to honor our seven mothers. Our own mother, who is our first guru, to honor the wife of our teacher or guru, to honor the wife of a king, to honor the wife of a Brahmin, to honor our most benevolent mother cow, and to the one who gives us the nectar of the holy name, our Lord Vishwambara, and finally, our sacred mother earth. Thank you very much. Can you recommend some ways to be a good mother? Well, I, th I think in, in all cases, it's, it's really important to just keep the communication lines open. That I think the, the best mothers are the ones who always have that relationship where they're not the big boss lady, but they just are able to really speak and, and really hear. I mean, you know, we've all heard before, we have one mouth that's naturally closed, we have two ears that are by nature open. So I think, as a matter of fact, my husband, he's, he's the communications director, as you mentioned. And when, I, when we were raising Goravani, he would often say to me, um, in any communications, he's the communications director, in any communication, who is controlling the conversation? The one who is speaking or the one who is listening? So what do you think? The one who's listening, so especially teenagers or even children of any age, can so easily just shut their ear holes to not hear at all what you're having to say. So you might be blah, 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 and they have completely shut you out. So um, another thing I would, I would say that is part of that being able to hear and also to be able to see, we were talking about this earlier, being able to really see, um, is to catch them doing it right. Usually what happens in parenting is we catch them doing wrong and intuitively and maybe subconsciously children know they get more attention when they do something wrong. They get more bang out of the relationship when they do something wrong, more attention, you know. Sometimes uh, there's, you, you've heard of the disease of influenza. There's another disease called affluenza. So when we have this disease of affluenza in the modern world, so often parents will be buying something for their kids and they, what the kids really want is attention of the parents, love and, and attention, which is the most, really the most precious thing to give is your attention. So um, catch them doing it right instead of, you know, they bring home the report card and there's three A's and one B and the parent says, ah, what's this B or what's this C? Instead of, hey, good job, you did you got three A's, or but you know you understand. So it's it's a, an art we can learn to catch them doing it right, 
and give them more attention for doing things right. I wouldn't say that I did such a good job in raising Gauravani. I would usually have to say the opposite of what I wanted him to do. But those are a few thoughts. And, and I, actually, I'll add one more thing. And I think this works in any relationship, in a relationship with a husband and wife, in a relationship with a child. Um, the power of an apology is extremely powerful. I heard Gauravani do this. When we had, we took 30, brought 30 people to India, Gauravani and I, and, um, and he had his little son Kirtan with him. And once Kirtan was trying to help with some of our communications and Gora kind of chastised him, now, it's not respectful, you know, you're talking and you know, we're trying to communicate. But Gora had actually under, misunderstood what Kir Kirtan was trying to help. Because we had a little code with everyone. When we wanted to get everyone's attention, we were going <coughs> That was our code. So Kirtan was doing this and Gora misunderstood. And Kirtan was, he was very hurt and kind of angry. So Goravani apologized to him. He sort of took it, you know. But then afterwards, actually, I think it was the next morning, he said in front of the whole group of 30 people, he said, I really want to apologize to my son Kirtan for misunderstanding his, his motives. He was trying to help. And it was, it was extremely powerful to have this little child receive an apology from an adult in front of all these other adults. Okay, thank you very much. This was very wonderful. Thank you. Even as a worldwide traveling preacher, I always try to keep this mood of mother also there. So no matter what roles we are actually playing, what service, we can execute that in the role of mother. And I want to share one little exchange I had with some of the boys in Bangladesh. <coughs> Once, one Brahmachari was saying to me, our Guru Maharaj is our father, and you are our mother, and mother more important. And I was a little surprised. I was saying, really? How, how is it? Mother more important than Guru Maharaj? And he gave a very nice answer. He put his hand on his heart and he said, yes, mother more affection. And that gave me the realization that actually if we women really deeply play this role of being mother, we can become so prominent in devotees' lives. Yes, that's the power of, of a mother, of a woman. The feminine energy, very powerful. And if we use it properly, we can leave such deep impressions and imp impacts on, on people's hearts and lives, even as a preacher, you know? Yes. And another thing also which I want to share, once one of our uh, sannyasi gurus in Iskon Prabhupada Sabha, I won't mention any names, but he shared with me privately, he was referring to one of his god sisters who left this world some years ago, and he said to me, she is my mother in Krishna consciousness. I don't go anywhere without remembering her. Yes, and that again confirmed for me deeply this understanding how how important this mood and role of mother is. And mother in my understanding is has these yeah, we can have some sutras type thing that mother means she embodies the selfless mood of service. I am last, everybody else is first. Mother is not competing. Mother is not showing off. There's no room for, you know, sexual vibes or showing off. Then she is not mother. And she, she is, is this balancing and harmonizing force within the family or within the um, society at large, within the community. You know, so she has all these roles which are there on all levels. And if we ladies play that role in whatever service it may be, even as a leader, as a manager, as a temple president, as a preacher, whatever it may be. But if we try and, and execute it in that mood of mother, 
trying to make our men successful. Let them get the credit, like a mother wants to see her her son successful. You know, she's not competing with them. She wants to have them get the glory. So if we serve like that, that's very empowering for our men. And Prabhupada is saying, actually, women are meant to be the the power of inspiration, the auspicious source of energy to men. Again, on all levels. So that's kind of, you know, how I understand this serving as mother, even as a preacher in the renounced stage of life. Okay, so now we want to invite our next speaker, His Holiness Bhaktivedya Purnamaj, and he will um, more deeply unpack the same topic of these three mothers, of the wife of the Brahmana, the wife of the king or leader, manager, and wife of Guru. So please, Marge, share your words of wisdom with us. So Mano mentions that um, you have a teacher, and so then they teach knowledge. And so one has a debt to them. Then in the family, we see that the uh, mother and father are there, they take care of us from when we're, you know, when we're unable to take care. And from that we have a debt. So in this, the effort that's put in by the between the mother and father, the mother then, Mano mentions the debt is ten times that of the father. Because the effort, the different things that they do, that we see the fathers, you know, they're busy doing other things. So, then he goes on to say that the so, the teacher then is equal to the father. But he also mentions that the uh, teacher who gives spiritual knowledge, that's equal to the mother. Because that really, that actually brings up the, um, how you say, the real purpose. Because the, the point is, is that the whole system that we're talking about, the whole culture that's there, is all meant to try to become God conscious. Because the whatever goes on here then will be the reflection of the spiritual world. So the spiritual world then is where things are eternal. Because here's the principle will be seen. You'll have mother, you'll have father, you have other relations and all that. But the potency of that is coming through the universal form. Because you see, as we're taking, you know, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, and then it's acting as mother. Same soul in another body of earth, water, fire, air, and ether acts as father, or brother, or sister, or right. So there's a potency that's there, the Lord, because these relationships come from Him. He's Rasa. So the five Rasas come from Him. It's so. Many times we'll talk about, you know, Mother Jashoda's in, you know, parental in rasa, or the gopis there in the conjugal rasa, the cowherd boys, like this. But you don't hear about what rasa is Krishna in, right? Because he's not in a rasa, he is rasa. So then when he arranges for the living entities to take, come to the material world, then he expands to make everything work. He's the one that makes it all function. So we see in the, and, and we see in the in instructions that Krishna is giving to the gopis when they first come, at the rasa dance, when he meets them, after the rasa dance, when he sends Uddhava. Then he's always pointing out that he is everything, and everything is him. And so one can look at that from that principle of just okay, he's God, he's doing all this. But the point that he's bringing out to the devotees is, is that it's because of his affection he's doing this. 
So these are all five different kinds of affection that are there that are coming from Krishna. Right? So that's the actual basis on why these positions are appreciated and respected because they represent Krishna. Right? So Krishna is taking care of everything. He's in the heart. He makes everything function. You want something to happen. It does. Right? And as Mataji pointed out, is do you see Krishna involved in this? No. He's in the background. He points out in the 11th canto that he himself likes the indirect aspect where he's brought out, but brought out from that indirect. He appreciates that. So this aspect pleases him. That's why you see as it goes up, then these parental rasas and these other things, because they're more hidden, they're more appreciated. So the Vedic concept is that the position of mother is respected because of the representation of the Lord. Now the particular individual who's taking up that responsibility, then they are respected for doing that. Because for Krishna it's all personal. Because we can say, oh, but they're not actually doing it, Krishna's doing it. But then if we look at that, then we're not doing anything. Krishna's doing everything. But the point is, for Krishna, it's the interaction that's important. It's not, it's not what energy is moving what that's there just as long as you understand that it all goes back to him. So that appreciation then becomes very important. Because if on these finer levels you can't appreciate the position of mother, then basically no other relationships will really come to the forefront. If they do, then that's nice. Then through that, then one can expand. But you can see it's the natural position, because from the mother, you know the father, you know the teacher, you know those other siblings, you know everything else from there. Being the first guru, everything expands from there. So this, this position that is there, it has this aspect. So we can appreciate, but at the same time is then those who are in the position they also have that way they can be God conscious. Because it's not that, okay, they're just the mother. But the position comes up as they're representing that potency in the Lord. Because mother means what's the prin principle is that nourishment. So, the mother specifically is responsible to see to the physical and emotional uh, nourishment. But you see in the devotee field also then the spiritual is coming up. So for Krishna then the, this aspect of cultivating Krishna consciousness, this then becomes uh, very important. And if, oh, how you say? Hmm. Yeah. So we see with the uh, example that the gopis give, well, after Krishna tells them that, you know, you've come, it's very nice, you came out, saw the evening, the moon is very nice tonight, you know, the weather is very good, you came out for your stroll in the forest, but now that you've seen everything, now it's time to go back home. So they point out is that their family members, that they're there, they're, they're involved, but how they're able to function is that they're seeing them all as connected to Krishna that the motherness is there, the fatherness, the childrenness, well, all these things, this is all Krishna. Because he's what makes it function. That's why the experience is the same. Doesn't matter what place, what time, or what community, what culture, the experience between the parent and child and all that, it's the same. Right? Even go into the animal king, it's the same. Because it's Krishna that's pervading. He's creating this. Because otherwise, how does dead matter, you know, decide that, okay, you know, it's like, how, you know, this chair and that chair. What's the relationship? Right? So Krishna empowers. So it works. Then it has that flavor. And because it's Krishna, therefore it must be respected. That's the whole point. So they're seeing Krishna in whatever they're doing. So they're at their house. They, they you know, in those situations, they're married. 
there's so many children in the house, other co-wives, all these other things, mothers-in-laws, all these other aspects. Yeah, notice in the seven mothers. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> so that aspect then is, is being brought out that they're seeing Krishna. And that's the thing, it reminds them of Krishna. So, much of the time it comes up as that, okay, we're spiritual, or we get sentimental. Right? And sometimes we see never the twain shall meet. Right? It's one or the other. And, you know, they'll be opposed to each other, and this has been going on since time immemorial. But the point is, is that one can be Krishna conscious and at the same time the culture is followed because that's what Krishna expects. He's God, he's controlling everything, he is everything, but he follows the culture and interacts. That's where the taste is. The taste is in the interaction. It's not in the position, the power, the authority. Because Krishna has that. He doesn't have to compete. So for him, that interaction with the devotees based on whatever position they see him in, that's what's the attractive aspect. So therefore, one can follow all the principles that are given in the Varnashram, all the cultural aspects very nicely, and be fully God-conscious. The gopis are doing it, right? And we wouldn't say that their house is necessarily the most ideal, right? They have relatives that aren't really very impressed with their affection for Krishna. But within that, they're able to always see Krishna. So they're always being able to be absorbed. So that thing is the Vedic is always these, this balance. It's not political. It's not economic. It's not about what you're going to gain. It's not about getting free of the material world. It's about remembering Krishna. And if you do that, everything else comes. So much of the time it's misunderstood that bhakti means, okay, we detach from everything, or bhakti means we can engage everything. No, bhakti means you remember Krishna. That's bhakti. And so in doing that, as one matures, and one starts to see the value of the relationships, how those relationships, why are they valuable? Because they come from Krishna. Then appreciating that, then one is able to uh, see Krishna and the culture naturally comes along. Bhakti includes the culture. Prabhupada said, philosophy without religion is mental speculation. And religion without philosophy is sentiment. Right? So we see they, it goes way back. Because the religion is the practical application of the philosophy. So they have to match. But, because Krishna... He is everything. He, it's about pleasing Him. He gives the culture. Right? We don't create the culture. So if we're remembering Him, then the mediums through which that remembrance goes on nicely, then it's given by Him. We follow that, it works. It is balanced. We may not see the logic of it and this and that, but it is balanced. Why? Because we're dealing with, this, with, with the Lord. We're dealing with unlimited. So the fine points and all these things. So it's a matter of revelation. Krishna being beyond logic, then it's not a matter of us understanding through logic. It's us, by surrender, he reveals. Right? That's why we use the term realization. Realization means there's that surrender, and then from that application, then we get an understanding. Otherwise, no. So we have to appreciate that Krishna being the central feature. All relationships are based on that. As Lord Chaitanya is, was saying in Chaitanya Charitamrita, that Sambandha means that Krishna is the center of all relationships. Right? Abhideya means all activities are meant to please Krishna. That means all these relationships, all these interactions, all the culture is meant to please Krishna. And all goals are for that pleasure of Krishna. So if that's kept in mind, then we see these two can run together. Because Krishna is non-dual, so he doesn't have a problem in both things happening at once. Everything is him, but everything's different from him. And for him, that's not a problem. Right? But as soon as we say it's this or that, then we, it immediately drops to the political platform. It's no longer spiritual. Right? Because the two go together. 
So the philosophy, the culture, they go together. We see the devotees are very nice, they're very comfortable, very uh, uh, well behaved. That's because it's all about Krishna. So naturally all the good qualities come when we surrender to Krishna and follow according to that. Then we'll see is that these relationships are appreciating the position of mother. It's not either a sentiment or something, oh, we're detached, we don't get involved in that. It's a matter of it's, the position is Krishna. The potency is Krishna. We appreciate that, we're respecting that. So when it says that the, the, the devotee respects all living entities, means that's, that's, that's literal. We're not, that's not just a nice poetic thing just to s- say we're nice guys. It's whatever is happening in every position, that's Krishna. And if one can do that, then one will find one can always be Krishna conscious. And at the same time, one finds that uh, all interactions, all positions, all relationships, they all go very nicely. With that. Sorry. Thank you. Hare Krishna. One question comes to my mind okay. that the wife of Guru, Brahmana and King or leader, how 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 can in the modern days of Iskon how can the wife play that role of mother? Can you elaborate a little bit mm. on that? How how it could, yeah, just for us ladies to mm-hmm. understand how mm-hmm. to actually cultivate that mood and how to practically manifest it. Mm. Yeah, it means, in other words, it's understanding what we're working with because the particular bodies we have, they're, they're tools. And as we see, as you know, Prabhupada explained the karma, the one in the female body is the man who remembered the wife at death, and the, the one who's in the male body is the women who remembered the husband at death. Like that. So it just keeps changing every life, like that. Or it may go on for a few lives. You know, the Hindus talk about, you know, how you say uh, in the marriage vows being married for seven lifetimes. So, you know, it seems that that's the maximum you can get out of it. At some point, it's going to switch. But, it, but, but they haven't said necessarily who's who in the next marriage like that. You know, they generally take it that, you know, yeah, but whatever. No one's no one's asking either. So So w- we have two aspects that are going on here. See is means means Krishna is the primary element. Right? So he's he's the controller of the Icha Shakti. So everything Icha means desire. So it's about his desire, everything's functioning on that. Now, for that desire to be manifest then it's about, you know, so in his desire, that manifests the devotees, the Dom, you know, the pastimes, all these different aspects. But for that to happen, then there's the Kriya and Jnana Shaktis which support that. So then, the, this aspect of the Kriya and Jnana, they take care of the facilities, the particular relationships, the mechanics of what goes on. You know, so if you want to do something, it's about the relationship, but there's mechanical elements that are done to make it happen. There, so those mechanical elements are for expressing the main aspect of the relationship. So if that's appreciated, then one can see what's happening in the Dham. So because it's about Krishna, you don't really have to make a distinction between what's going on in the spiritual world. But you can. Like Mother Jashoda then her, her rati or her attraction to Krishna is the parental rasa. So that's her affection for Krishna. That's the primary aspect. The secondary is she, she manifests that through the activities of cooking for Krishna, arranging for his clothes, his bath, his, all these other aspects. Right? But, in le- but those only have value because they manifest her affection. Right? So we see that there's two things that happen at once. There's the main thing, the primary and secondary there. That's reflected into the material world. So, so because Krishna being everything, everything coming from him, it will have the same nature. So in the material world, even though it's all secondary, because it's not about Krishna, but you can still find primary and secondary within it. Right? So then in this case, 
then we're looking at the relationships and that experience that's there. That's the primary aspect. The secondary aspect are, is the mechanical things that are done to express that. So if it's appreciated and understood, then the masculine nature tends to focus on the mechanical aspect. Feminine nature m tends to focus on the experiential aspect. If the mechanics are perfect, the man's happy. But if the mechanics are perfect, but the experience isn't good, the women won't be happy. So the experience has to be proper, even if the mechanics aren't great. So that's why sometimes it's not really understood. You see, women can do things so expertly, mechanically, or not. Because the point is, is whatever creates the experience is all that's necessary. So if technical is necessary to get the experience, technical will be done. But if it's not, it won't. But for the men, they'll tend to always do it mechanically perfectly. That's at least they'll try for it. So in all these positions, then you'll see is that bringing out to see that that personal element's not lost in the mechanics. That's the main thing that the, we see is the feminine element brings into this. Because it's like, uh, what do you call it? Seeing the, for you can't see the forest for the trees kind of thing. Is that men will get into sometimes so much detail they forget you know, what it's about. You know, you're, you're managing the festival, trying to make it so perfect and everything exact and the timing and all that, that you're not really worried about the, the devotees or the people, the experience. And so then the wife brings these things up. Like that. And so that's, that's that, that aspect. Then that's what balances. So when we say balance, it means it's, it's balancing something else that's already there. Because you can only have a balance if the two have, have the same kind of, have some equal power. So it's different kinds of power. This idea is that equality means same power, then, then you're dealing with the same thing. Right? It's just like, okay, we have that chair over there. Okay, we have a relationship. What's your relationship with that chair? Right? Because it's exactly the same chair. And that one over there, and that one over there. There's no uniqueness. So we have to understand is that Krishna is unique. His potencies are unique. As they expand, they're all unique. And they have this masculine and feminine aspect. One has to know what is what, because we're the soul. We're not the body. We're not the men. We're not the women. As soon as we start talking, we're the men, we're the women, we've actually lost the plot. Plot is we're devotees. And we work through this. Does this make sense? To give a simple example, if I'm cooking potatoes, it's not about me, I'm the big controller of the vegetables. It's about, I deal with potatoes as you can deal with potatoes. And that's going to be different than if I have a pile of spinach. Does that make sense? So you deal according to the nature that's there. So it's a, it's a big science, because Krishna is a Shakti, Shakti Man, and then there's the Shakti, how these two interact. And you see when you're dealing on Rasa, then the f feminine nature is the powerful one. But if you're dealing mechanics, then because you can, men can deal in mechanics with zero emotion, they won't function very well for women. So the women have to bring back that, the whole point is, is yes, the mechanics are perfect, but they have to be subservient to that experiential aspect. Right? Because we say it's a culture of Krishna consciousness, not as a perfect mechanics of Krishna consciousness. Right? So that always has to be seen, and if that science is seen, then you know where the power is. Otherwise, we'll fight over mechanics. We won't fight over experiential. Right? So that's the problem. We, we miss the point. We are told to see any woman besides our wife as mother. How can we practically have this vision? Well, I think there's this old... Um, it was kind of like a... Um, I think this song was by a comedian, maybe back from the maybe 60s. Uh, he was talking about being... Uh, nice to, uh, I think it was basically was talking about being nice to birds and all that, because that bird that you're harassing might be someone's mother. 
I don't know if anyone knows this reference, but uh, like that, you know, how you say <laughs> Yeah, that's the problem nowadays. Most references I give, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Right? You know? <laughs> so the whole point is, is that's the potential. Manu mentions that men are, it means, you know, boys are born to become fathers and girls are born to become mothers. So that's the potency, that's the principle that's there. Someone steps out of that and functions in, in the, the aspect of renunciation, and that's fine. That's because it's for the spiritual purpose. But the principle is that the potency is that of mother. It's the same activities, the same uh, elements of nourishment and all that. Because if that's seen, then that's a strong position. Then one deals properly. Because if, if you see his mother, then you put, put in a senior position. But if you don't see in that way, then that can put it... I mean, if it's in a junior position, okay, his daughter, then it'll still have the parental rasa. But if you don't, you put it as equal, equal means conjugal. King's school means sense gratification. So especially in the modern contemporary environment, it's always trying to be that the feeling is that of equal, but that always brings out the sexual aspect. So, so as soon as you put it that it's senior or junior, then, then you, do, the, you get rid of that. But we see the recommendation in the Vedic is senior. Right? That's the position. And it's, it's, and it's a matter of culture. I've seen it myself. I remember when, you would that been, 70, maybe 74. We were going around and, and many times you do programs, you're in somebody's, you know, somebody's house. I think these things, these programs, I, I was in, maybe we're in Bombay or in South India, either Bangalore or Madras. And um, at some point in the program we're taking Prashad. And much of the time, you will see, just like it mentions in the, in the, the Bhagavatam, then, then uh, for the, Su uh, what's her name? Subhadra Devi wasn't married. So to increase her piety, then to, you know, give fortune to her life, then her, her, her seniors then see to that, uh, you know, rendering of service to the, you know, the, the sadhus, the guests like that. And so then when Arjuna came disguised as a sannyasi, then she was the one serving Prashad. And so then she's dealing in all the nice ways and this and that. And so then that principle, I can remember being at the houses, and that time then we would have been like 19 years old or something. And so then, but the girls that were serving us may have been that age or even younger. You know, they would have been in their teens, so been, they would have been more trained. But the mood in which they would serve the prashad and deal in that was exactly no different than the elder ladies who were dealing. So it was exactly his mother. So it's so you're feeding, you want to see, and all this and that. So it was never seen as a trouble. So the relationship is able to be expressed through that. So one just naturally deals in that way. So the, the, the point of, I would say, that is an important... Um, yeah, let's see. Element to regulate it is generally we take it that we're looking, we're expressing the mother means we're expressing the sense of possession. But that doesn't work unless you have everything else that goes with it. It's more the aspect of that nourishment, that aspect of it, that care for just that things are going to work out properly. That aspect. Because I've seen a lot of times girls will try to bring that thing of mother and they immediately just put the thing of possession. And that won't work unless that's a cultivated relationship. Right? If it is, then it naturally comes. But they have to take that. That's why the, the shelter and the other aspects, they have that possession in, in other elements. You know, with their father, with the husband, with the with the uh, son, with, you know, with other relatives, with somebody. And so then that's there, that's focused there. Then with others, you can just deal in that, that very pleasant, balanced way. But if you try to project this sense of possession on someone that you don't have that, then it, it never, it doesn't, you don't get the right reaction. Does that make sense? Like, the, like I was saying, these girls are there. There's no sense of possession. It's just you're a guest. They're serving. This is the proper way to serve. 
So there's no, they're not trying to control like that. And also an interesting thing in, in the marriage ceremony, in Sakriya Sardipika, in the pi- Panigrahana, is it Panigrahana? Yeah, I think so. There's ten like blessings the husband's giving for the wife, you know, well-wishing and all that. And one of them is, always I found it interesting ones, may you be the controller of my mother, may you be the controller of my father. This is the, the br- groom is saying, may you be the controller of my sisters and brothers and others. May you control the whole thing. So, but it's not about control by mechanics, it's control by the qualities, the interaction, the endearing element that you control everybody. That's the control. You know, does that make sense? So, you know, we're not talking about, uh, how you say, the, how you say, the Tomb Raider control, like that, yeah. Yes, I mean, even in the family unit, we can say the father is the official family head, but yeah. who runs the show? It's the mother. And not by telling everybody what to do, but through her service, through her selflessness. She controls and ties up everybody's heart. Hmm. And that's how she runs things. And in the same way also in the larger family of an yeah. ISKCON community, that's how we women can run yeah. the show, actually, through our selfless service and devotion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you so okay. much, Marsh. It good. was very thank nice. Thank, thank you. you. If I may add a couple of little things which I learned in Bangladesh in regards to seeing every woman as mother, because this role of mother is so important, that's why the young girls are trained in this role of serving in the mood of mother. And that's why even young girls by their own father are called ma, mother. So a father will address his two-year-old daughter as mother. Yes, yes. I mean, that was quite eye-opening for me. And when we hear this, we, we often think mother has to be older because we think in the, on the bodily platform, you know, how can we call somebody mother who is younger? But no, to, to help us create this vision of seeing every woman as mother, and also for the men that they can cultivate this mood of seeing every woman as mother. That's, that's why in spiritual culture we usually address women as mothers, because that will help us to have that cultivate that vision that everybody is mother. And simply, yeah, I find it very interesting that already young girls they're called mother, so that they very naturally grow into this role of, of serving in, in the mood of mother. Not meaning that she has to be physically a mother, but with that mood of, of mother nurturing, balancing, harmonizing, and, and, and. Okay, so I would like to invite our next pre- uh, speaker, Her Grace Prabhupada Priya Madhaji. Again, I want to say a few introductory words. She is the wife of Yagyamurti Prabhu. She's been a resident for many years in Mayapur. Madhuji, how, le- how many years have you been living in Mayapur? This is the te- <coughs> tenth year. Tenth year. And she brought up two very beautiful daughters. She's been teaching in the international school for many years. She's a very um, um, enthusiastic book distributor. She leaves almost every year to London or something, distributing books in London. And very nice speaker also. I personally like her Bhagavatam classes very much. So let us hear. She will um, enlighten us now more on the on the role of the physical mother. So we went from the seven mothers to the three mothers. Now we're coming to the physical mother. Hare Krishna. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshura Militanjena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha So I guess I'm the physical mother here. <laughs> uh, Maharaj was talking about how uh, Women are interested in experience. So I'm going to talk about my experience 
which is quite different from, uh, you've been hearing a more philosophical and erudite approach to the concept of motherhood. So I'm going to talk about my experience of being a mother for the past 20 years, a bit more, 21 years. So, um, Srila Prabhupada said in a lecture that marriage without children is, does anybody know? He says zero. <laughs> Maybe he said other things, desert, sense gratification. But one lecture that I specifically remember, he says, marriage without children is zero. <laughs> and I always wondered about that. And after, going, after raising my children, I realized why he said that. Because marriage the gri gri is grihasta ashram. So like any ashram, it's meant for purification and it's meant for spiritual cultivation. And so for that, the, so in each ashram, there's specific things that need to be there in order for the purification to happen the way it's meant to happen. And in the Grihasta ashram, one of the, those things that needs to be there is children. So if you don't have children, you can go through some semblance of Grihasta ashram, but you're not going to get the same purification. Or at least you're not going to get the full dose of the medicine. It's like sometimes when you take a medicine, if you have a disease, you have to take two medicines. You know, one makes the other work. <coughs> or one helps the body, like a vitamin. <coughs> you, you have a de vitamin deficiency, so you take the vitamin, but you need to take something else in order to assimilate the vitamin. So you need the two things conjointly. So children are like that. If you're going to get the real benefit, the medicine, the purification of the Grihasta Ashram, then you need children. Otherwise, you can't, uh, you can't proceed properly. You don't get the full benefit. So therefore, motherhood is very important. Motherhood and also fatherhood. But since we're talking about mothers, we'll emphasize that. And motherhood is actually, the way I see it, is Krishna's transcendental trick for uh, freeing women from selfishness. Because, I mean, men and women alike, everyone is born into the material world <coughs> uh, with the false conception that I am the controller, I am the enjoyer, and it's all about me. I want to be the center of attention, I want to be adored, I want to be worshipped. So this affects everyone. But women particularly uh, are very attached to their bodies and to bodily comforts. And so uh, motherhood really slackens that attachment very effectively. Even before the child is born, if anyone's, how many of you have gone through pregnancy? <laughs> Not so many. How many of you are planning to go through pregnancy? Not so many? Okay, a few. <laughs> so then even before the child is born, you realize that this body is not my own. Right? As soon as you become pregnant, you realize this body is not my own. That uh, now I'm, I'm sure there's another individual soul who's inhabiting my body and tapping into its resources and its energy and... You know, it, you, you really start, I mean, I really started to see this body as just a machine that is here supplying certain needs. And it's something very separate from myself. And especially during pregnancy, it goes through all these amazing uh, changes. You know, it like, <laughs> it like, you know, changes its form, it changes its hormone balance, it changes uh, all these uh, crazy things happen, that, you know, mentally, psychologically, and ev in every way it changes in order to accommodate and provide for the, the, the soul. And most of these changes are not very pleasant. <laughs> They're not very enjoyable. And nor do we have any control over them. So from the very start, you realize, I'm not this body, I'm not the enjoyer, I'm not the controller. And these are very important lessons to learn. And that's before you even gave birth. <laughs> so then if I'm not the controller, I'm not the enjoyer, I'm not this body, who am I? That you realize after the child takes birth. 
Then you realize your constitutional position. I am the servant of the servant of Krishna. So motherhood is very good because it affords unlimited opportunities for Vaishnav Seva. Especially as devotee mothers, because we're trying to, uh, you know, we're performing Garbhadam Samsara, Samskara. We're praying that a, 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 will, a devotee will enter our womb and continue his progress back home, back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada said that these children are not ordinary, they're Vaikunti children. They're coming from previous either devotional backgrounds or highly pious backgrounds on the way to devotion. And so uh, we give birth to exalted personalities. And, you know, every disciple is so much wanting to do personal service for the guru or personal service to senior devotees. But especially for women, if your guru is a sannyasi, you don't have many opportunities for personal service. But Krishna gives us these uh, Vaikuntha children and gives us unlimited opportunities for personal service. So Vaishnava Seva is there. Not only that, but we get unlimited impetus for being Krishna conscious. Because as mothers, we want more than anything that our children become Vaishnavas, become fixed up devotees. We want, them, we want this to be the last birth in the material world. And so, just uh, another day, Bhaktivedya Purnamaj was giving class, and one devotee asked about, he was talk, asking about preaching strategies. And Maharaj very wisely said, the best preaching strategy is to be Krishna conscious. And so, if we want our children to be Krishna conscious, we have to be Krishna conscious. We want them to uh, be enthusiastic in devotional activities. We have to be enthusiastic in devotional activities. We want them to have good sadhana. We have to have good sadhana. We want them to eat only Krishna prasadam. We have to eat only Krishna. So whatever we want them to be, we have to be. And so that pushes us to be something better. And that's very helpful. It's extremely favorable for our devotional service. As a mother, I was always conscious that uh, my children are, are not mine. They're not my little babies or my, you know, girls or whatever. Although sometimes, you know, in, in speaking, we speak that way. But I always felt like these are Krishna's eternal servants that somehow or other, by their karma and by the supervision of the Lord, have been placed in my care. And that it's my duty to help them to pick up where they left off in the last life and progress. And especially for children, uh, as I was saying before, if we want them to be nice devotees, we have to be nice devotees because uh, children are wired to learn by example. They're wired to learn by imitating. And so Prabhupada in his guidance for uh, raising children in Krishna consciousness, he often said that just have them follow the same program that the adults follow. So, I mean, ironically, it's kind of sad that many uh, mothers, before I became a mother, many mothers would say things like, I mean, and even now, many mothers say things like, yeah, I used to always go to Mangalarti every day, but since I've had the baby, now it's very difficult and, you know, I have to, I can't make it. Or I used to read Prabhupada's books every day and now I just can't find the time. Or even, uh, you know, since the child was born, I haven't been able to, I haven't managed to complete my 16 rounds. So it can be a challenge. But we have to not use our children as an excuse to not be Krishna conscious. Rather, we have to use them as a reason to be Krishna conscious. So we should think, yes, even if I wasn't going to Mangalarti before, now I have to go because I have to bring the child. Because I have to train the child that the first thing that we do when we wake up in the morning is we take bath, put on fresh clothes, tilak, and go and see Krishna. We start the day with Krishna. And if we don't do that, then who are we? 
that this is our identity. Every day we go and see Krishna. And also, the morning program that Srila Prabhupada established in ISKCON is like the perfect routine for children. And children thrive on routine. It's very good for children to do the same thing at the same time every day as far as possible. And the morning program is exactly, perfectly that. So just taking the children through that daily routine gives them a sense of stability and identity, which is uh, very essential and which is sorely lacking in the chaotic world that we live in. So it's very important to, to do these things. And also japa. We really have to, mothers have to really make it a point to chant better rounds. Okay, we were chanting 16 before. We should try to increase now. Because we need to have the spiritual strength. Because now, before you were just a, you know, you were somebody's wife, you were whatever, you had your service, but now you're somebody's guru. You automatically became a guru. Like overnight. You went from wife to guru. So guru means uh, prachar and achar. And the Yuga Dharma is chanting the holy name. So as a mother, you have to set the example of the importance of chanting the holy name. And to chant nicely, chant, uh, to chant visibly. So our children should see us chanting. They should see how we sit down and focus on chanting. And uh, actually, I, I developed a very good strategy for doing this. <laughs> I never missed 16 rounds in my whole motherhood career. Uh, and the, do you want to know how I did it? It's difficult. It is difficult. I will say it's very difficult in those early years, especially the first few months uh, because you know the last months of pregnancy are very difficult childbirth is you know horrendous and then all you want to do after giving birth is rest but you cannot <laughs> because the baby wakes up you know every two hours sometimes every one and a half hours through the night uh, to be fed and you're the only one who can do it it's not something you can be like oh you know Call your husband, can you take care of it? Feed the baby. No, you've got to do it. So while your body is still racked from childbirth, you can't sleep. And you can't sleep for months. <laughs> so, we're, oh yeah. so it's very difficult and because all day you're tired and then you've still got to do all the o other things that you always did and plus take care of the baby. So when are you going to chant? So this is what I did. And uh, I recommend this. I think it's good for both the mother and the baby, and I'll explain why. So what I did was, whenever the child was uh, needing to be fed, because you've just got to sit down and feed the baby. You can't do anything else during that time except chant. So whenever I was breastfeeding the baby, I would chant japa. You can always chant one or two rounds and the time it takes for them to finish and then you, you know you put them and then you put your beads away and go on with your your duties so you know every 2 hours or every 3 hours around the clock so let's say in the beginning it's every 2 hours so then you've got 12 uh, times a day where you've got like 15 minutes you can easily chant more than 16 rounds and then as they feed less often then you you know but then as they become a little more autonomous, then you can chant at other times too. And it's very good for the baby because they grow up associating the sound of japa, the sound of the chanting of the holy names, with nourishment, with affection, with warmth, with comfort. And so they develop all of these very positive associations with the holy name. I'll tell you a funny story that uh, uh, when my older daughter was uh, about maybe one and a half, two years old, one day she was, uh, I was doing some things in the house, and sh she, was fr she was looking all over for something. She was like frantic to find something. And I said, uh, what are you looking for? And she said, your bead bag. And I said, why do you want to find my bead bag? I didn't get it. But she, she didn't answer the question. She just kept looking and looking and looking. Finally, she found the bead bag, and she held it up, like, you know, victoriously. She ran towards me with the bead bag, dove into my lap, and handed me the bead bag, and then indicated that she wanted to breastfeed. And I was like, 
in her mind, it's like she was going to starve if the bead bag wasn't there because she's so much connected <laughs> the two activities. It was amazing. So I thought, I felt like, wow, she really got trained, trained well. And then, uh, so that's how to get your japa done. And then another thing I'd like to talk about is cooking. Because cooking is a, ver is a very important thing. And as mothers, another thing that I see that's very sad is that after the children are born, they tend to start cutting corners with prashadam. You know, like buying packaged biscuits and, you know, convenience foods and, you know, n things that are not very high standard that are prepared by non-devotees and which are infected with, you know, non-devotional consciousness. So... We really need to make an extra effort to cook for our children. One time I read a quote, I think it was from an Ayurvedic book, book on Ayurveda, that if you eat food which is cooked by someone who loves you, you'll never get sick. And so who can love a child more than the mother? And if your mother is a devotee, if the mother is a devotee, and she's cooking for Krishna with love, then it's like double love. You're getting the mother's love for Krishna and the mother's love for you and it's all going into the food and it's so, uh, it's just so beneficial for the, the physical, the psychological, the emotional, the spiritual well-being of the child. And I remember when my children were small, we were living in Vrindavan and uh, my children, I don't know if I was lucky or unlucky, most people would say I was lucky, but for me it made a lot of work. But my children always had really super good appetites. <laughs> they were always hungry. And so, which meant that I had to cook, you know, sometimes four or five times a day. And uh, it was hard. Yeah, it was difficult. It was hard work and it was, it was a hassle. But it was my duty and I did it and I felt really good about doing it. And I think my children benefited a lot from that. And to this day, they, they have no interest in eating any kind of, like, karmi food. They, they just won't have it. They have no attraction. If somebody will offer them, you know, biscuits from a packet, they'll just be like, no, I have my prashadam at home. <laughs> like that. So it's very good. So like this, a mother's... Uh, as a mother, my meditation was always... My meditation and my prayer was always how to help these children become Krishna conscious and to be inspired. And so I found myself just going through the day doing one Krishna conscious activity with them after another, reading Krishna conscious books and, uh, you know, we, I made dolls, Krishna and Balaram and puppets and all of these things for them and uh, singing Krishna conscious songs, teaching them to chant, to play musical instruments, and performing, encouraging them to perform Krishna conscious dramas, uh, encouraging them to take part in Krishna conscious festivals, and all of these things. In fact, when my daughter was born, she was born in America, but when she was one year old, we moved to Vrindavan, just so that they could grow up in a Krishna conscious atmosphere. Because we could understand how you know, children, they don't have this sense, their intelligence is not so well developed to have a dis sense of discrimination about, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's favorable, what's unfavorable. They're just like sponges. They just soak up everything. And so we thought, okay, we don't want them sponging up materialistic culture. We want them to sponge up Krishna. <laughs> so we took them to Vrindavan, that they could grow up in that atmosphere where Krishna consciousness is just normal and natural. And so they grew up with that that feeling, that, that uh, supportive environment. And for education, we, we moved to, to Mayapur. So all these things... Uh, so there are all these different things we can do with our kids. And as mothers, uh, our service is very dynamic. Because one thing is that uh, every child is different. You know, you have one child, for example, my older daughter, when she was young in Vrindavan, we, I was homeschooling her, and that was working out very well. Uh, but then when my younger daughter became school age, she would not have it. She just 
didn't want to learn from me. She's like, you're my mother, you're not my teacher. I'm not going to sit down and uh, learn math and, you know, learn how to read and write from you. So then we came to Mayapur and we put her in, sc- in the school here and she, she flourished. So that was nice. So we have to be sensitive to the needs of our children. Understand that each one has a different nature. And not only that, but as they grow, then uh, they also change. So it's not the same thing. It's, it's like every, 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 uh, every day when they wake up, they're basically a new person because their brains are developing, their bodies are developing, changing. Uh, and so it's always different. It's always a different experience. It's never the same old thing. You know, like sometimes if you have a, a service, it's just you do the same service every day, day after day. But even though in one sense, being a mother, you, you are doing the same service day after day, but that service changes every day. It's different every day. And so it's exciting. You know, you, you grow with the children because you have to always, as they change, you have to change. And you develop a kind of uh, sensitivity, which is very nice and very uh, favorable for other services and just dealing with people in general. Yeah, I was, as I was planning this, uh, what I was going to say, I was meditating on how uh, motherhood really helps us to uh, develop divine qualities, you know, like selflessness, like patience, uh, even though, you know, sometimes with children you have to tell them the same thing, you know, with, with me, I, one of my daughters, it was like, close the bathroom door and turn off the light when you leave, you know, it's like thousands of times, every time, year after year, day after day, I had to say, close, turn off the light and close the door of the bathroom, please. And then finally, you know, I think maybe she was 15, she finally started doing it on her own. (laughs) Anyways, we just have to keep being patient and repeating the same instruction again and again without becoming angry. One day they'll get it. And then tolerance, because they make mistakes. We all learn by making mistakes, and children don't know what what to do, and they often learn by doing the wrong thing and being corrected. So we just have to be tolerant. And we learn to accept others as they are. Because sometimes we want our children to be something, like Rukmini Manaji was saying, we want them to be like Ravi Gupta. But they're not. And, you know, when no amount of force or desire or prayers is going to make them somebody that they're not. We just have to accept them as they are. And to love them unconditionally, no matter what decisions they make, no matter what they do in their lives, even if they decide to not be devotees, we still need to love them unconditionally. And to always be their well-wishers. So I, w- I was thinking uh, about how all of these qualities, they very easily translate into a broader preaching. Because basically motherhood trains you to be a well-wisher, to be a preacher or a, a guru, because the mother is the first guru. So this mood of para upakar, that you become unhappy to see the unhappiness of others. That's just a mother's whole experience. Like all we do, because children, as they go, they go through many difficulties, and there's so much suffering in growing up. And the mother is always seeing how they're suffering and how they're struggling and trying to alleviate their pain, how to ease the pain, how to you know, t- uh, heal them when they get sick and uh, you know, put a Band-Aid on the wound when they cut themselves and when they have trouble with their friends, how to, coaching them how to deal with it and just all the difficulties, how to overcome them, how to alleviate their pain. So then... When our children are grown up, we're in the perfect position as vanaprastas to be preachers because we've got that selflessness and we can see all, uh, all living entities as our children and try to nurture them in Krishna consciousness as we did our own children and tolerate when they make mistakes and be patient as they take their own time to uh, you know, become accustomed to Krishna conscious practices and to love them unconditionally, and to allow them to be themselves in Krishna consciousness, which is very important. I was just, and to, to give them the affection, like Devi Kimaji was saying, the affection and the care that they need. Last week I was in uh, Mahatma Prabhu's retreat, and he was saying how uh, 
you know, if we, most of us who have been devotees for many years, if we reflect on what has made us devotees and what has kept us in devotional service year after year, it's usually not the philosophy. But it's, it's a person. We're all here. We all came to Krishna consciousness and we all stayed in Krishna consciousness because we all have at least one person who really deeply cared about us. And as preachers, it's very important that we cultivate that mood of, of affection. And not just, you know, find a new person who's interested in Krishna consciousness and just download everything that we ever learned about the philosophy. You know, give them a whole, the whole Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya, Charitamrita, all rolled up into one. Because that's not what they need. They need bits and pieces. But really, they need love. They need care, and they need to know that they're accepted. Whoever they are, wherever they're at, that we accept them, because Krishna accepts them. So really, the mother is the ultimate representative of Krishna, because Krishna accepts us for the unique individuals that we are. He's always encouraging us, and he loves us unconditionally. So having been a mother, and still being a mother, I'm aspiring to be a preacher and be able to uh, spread Krishna consciousness and inspire many people in Krishna consciousness in a caring, affectionate, uh, loving way. And I ask all of your blessings to be able to do that for the pleasure of Guru and Krishna. Uh. Thank you so much. I th I'm sure your presentation made it very clear that being a mother is not a waste of time, being mother is not an obstacle in our devotional life. I mean, you wouldn't believe how often I come across this, that people think to have a child is disturbing my spiritual progress. Mm. Yes, it, it is very sad. But hearing your wonderful presentation which you're giving with e deep experience and conviction. I'm simply hoping that this is inspiring for, for our ladies to take up this role of being mother. Because mothers, actually mothers are such important personalities. They are the first guru, they're planting the seed of bhakti in the heart. And not only that, they're creating the whole spiritual atmosphere in the home. And thus within society, it's actually the mother. And interestingly, in material life, there is no need for first guru. There is no need for a spiritual atmosphere in the home. So therefore, the mother is stripped of these two important contributions. And she is reduced to just being the cook and cleaner. Yes, this is what's going on. And of course a woman doesn't just want to be a cook and cleaner. So that's why, you know, women try to enter the workforce and find some, some you know, um, some appreciation and, and, and respect there. But I'm firmly convinced that we have to re-establish this important role mothers play. Because I can also find that and observe that very easily this conditioning of only being mother and housewife, which is out there in the material world, I mean it's almost an, an, you know, a disgrace to be only mother and housewife. We easily bring this into our spiritual practice. And even let's, let's be honest, even from a managerial point of view, Mothers are often seen as not big contributors in a community, you know, because we value people's contribution according to how much service they can do and how much money they can give. But mothers, you know, they're, they're, they're not interesting in that regards, and therefore we, we forget what valuable and important service mothers do because it's more long term, you know, it's not short term. So, mothers are the backbone of human society. 
And unless we manage to re-establish this, I cannot even see how Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement will be strong and powerful. Now, last but not least, we want to invite His Holiness Bhakti Vasamrita Maharaj to further, <laughs> to further enlighten us on this topic of, of the physical mother, because personally I'm convinced that we will not get very far in really honoring and caring for Mother Cow and Mother Earth if we cannot even respect our physical mothers, right? They have been serving us for so many years. So if we think, you know, being a mother is, 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 has no value and we don't give respect, we will never get there in, in, in protecting and serving the cow, mother cow or mother earth. So I, I feel we have to start with a physical mother. Otherwise, we, it is only some hobby, some lip, lip service. Yeah, the cows are very nice, but uh, it, it is not serious. It is not deep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Vienatasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Vienabhutale Swayam Rupa Kada Mahyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yutapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Nitinamine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravarni Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Bhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namo Nama <coughs> Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna <coughs> Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna It's been a very interesting evening. We've heard so many very thought-provoking, incisive points both of philosophy and practical life and experience and culture so far. It may seem a little ironic that a sannyasi has to be called upon to speak on the mother. But as Krishna Kshetra Maharaj mentioned, uh, everyone has a mother. So even those who are sannyasis have had mothers. And the contribution of the mother is, of course, paramount. There is that little research story you may have heard about. Some researchers at some university or something wanted to put a monetary value to the mother. So these researchers, they followed a particular lady who was a mother of some kids. And they went around with her and studied her lifestyle. <coughs> And then for everything that she did, for which of course she wasn't getting paid, because she was serving her kids and doing everything else, they put a monetary value. So she would drop her children to school. So well, she was doing it. So had they hired a taxi or maybe hired a, a driver, it would have cost something. Then she was cooking for them at home. So if you hired a cook, who would cook three or four times a day, it would have cost something. So she was a psychologist, she was a counselor, she was a nurse, she was everything. So for each of them, they tried to see how much they would have to pay to get someone to come and do all of this. And after they went through the whole exercise, they came up with a figure annually of 150,000 pounds, UK pounds, so in terms of U.S. dollars, it would be something like 200,000 U.S. dollars. 
So that was what they estimated the monetary contribution, the value of the mother. <coughs> of course, in and of itself, it's also a very interesting point of view. But it nevertheless misses something very, very important, which is something that money cannot buy. So even if somebody had hired cooks and drivers and nurses and everything, there would still be a very essential missing element, and that is the love and care that the mother gives to the child. Now, it is not possible for a paid person, generally speaking, to have that kind of spontaneous love and care that the mother would have for her children. Srila Prabhupada, in that very famous uh, quote, I'm sure you've all heard it many times, mentioned how child worship was more important than deity worship for a lady devotee who had just delivered a child and was very busy with looking after the child and could not do her pujari seva. And Prabhupada said, never mind, take this service very, very seriously. These children are not ordinary children, so you must do it with great responsibility. They are Vaikuntha children. Yes. And in the course of explaining the idea of devotional service, he gave the example of the mother. He said, devotional service means service with no expectation. Just like mother, he said. When mother serves her children, there is no expectation. She is not like a maid servant who is getting a salary or a wage. She simply serves out of affection, out of love. And then he said, this is a little sample of pure love. Elsewhere he mentions how the love of the mother for her children is the closest that you can find in the material world to the pure love of the spiritual world. Uh, but then he goes on to add a word of <coughs> qualification to that. And he says, but when the children grow up, if they are disobedient, then the mother might withdraw that love. It happens. The intensity of the love of the mother for the, ch the grown-up children may or may not be the same. Sometimes it may, but usually when the children start acting in certain ways, then there is a possibility of the love diminishing. So Prabhupada says she may withdraw her love, but in the spiritual world it doesn't happen like that. So the love of the mother for the child is something <coughs> exemplary. It's not done with any expectation, not for profit. I heard a quote the other day which somebody sent me. That if there is a lady who is speaking and no one's listening to her, it's very likely her name is Mother. <laughs> <laughs> So we've all been sons and daughters of some mother and we probably know we have subjected our mother to that, to the deaf ear. So it's a taxing service as we've been hearing. <coughs> However, giving love and affection and care is not the only thing that a mother does. There's another very important element which is giving good instruction, good education and very, very importantly, imparting character and getting the, the children imbibed with devotional service. Now all these are, are very, very important duties of the mother. So if one only gives love and affection but doesn't give these other parts, like good education, good instruction, devotional service, character, then there's something missing. The role of the mother is incomplete. So therefore, the two important things, number one is love, care, affection, etc. <coughs> and second is giving character, education, instruction, devotion, etc. Now, I want to read out some quotes from people whom we don't consider devotees, but and they're not from India. And to top it all, many of them are former presidents of different countries or kings. And I thought it will be interesting to just 
read a few of these quotes to say what they what they thought of their own mother so i've written them down and it's interesting because we don't hear leaders whether political or leaders in other spheres of life talking like this now so there's a world of difference and these quotes the earliest of them is probably 100 years old and the others are probably another two or three centuries before that at the most so the fact that leaders are speaking about these things about their mother in this way and today we hardly hear many people speaking about it indicates that there's a huge shift in the culture and the difference is that we have become excessively materialistic and godless in any country of the world even up to 100 years ago there was some degree of religious culture and along with that came values along with them along with these things came a family culture a family spirit and the role of the mother was very much a, an essential part of that but the more and more we have become materialistic and gone away from god in whichever religious culture of the world we see that the family spirit has started to get tenuous it's weakened and the role of the mother has become shaky and she no longer is seen to do the same kind of role that these gentlemen are talking about as they used to do before so i'll read these quotes the first four are former temple uh, not temple <laughs> presidents of of the us of us of a abraham lincoln no man is poor who has had a godly mother now never mind they may or may not be devotees quote unquote but if there's something we can learn from them no harm in taking it <clears throat> so no man is poor who has had a godly mother second john quincy adams i believe another president all that i am my mother made me short succinct but says the point abraham lincoln has an exactly almost as exactly similar quote another one then jefferson another president mothers make men number 4 george washington all i am i owe to my mother i attribute all success in life to the moral intellectual and physical education i received from her <clears throat> and then some other prominent personalities mark twain the famous humorist and writer it is at our mother's knees that we acquire our noblest and truest and highest ideals <coughs> he may or may not have been referring to god but we can take that in our way for us what are the noblest truest and highest ideals that's what the mother is supposed to give to the child Thomas Alva Edison the inventor My mother was the making of me These are all from the internet Sometimes we can make some good use of it Another personality George Herbert I don't know who he is I didn't have time to inquire but his quote is good whoever he may be god bless him <laughs> One good mother is worth 100 schoolmasters Many times our school teachers in different projects where I travel they complain that the parents put such a heavy burden of expectation on them and they are supposed to do everything to bring the child up but actually the school is fine the teachers are fine but the real responsibility rests with the mother and the father and especially the mother Next is another gentleman called D Beaufort again I don't know who he is The future of society lies in the hands of mothers. Very strong statement. The future of society lies in the hands of mothers. So by implication if the mothers are not respected, if they are not valued, then what happens? We are going to have a society which is in shambles. <coughs> And then Napoleon we come to France. The future destiny of the child is always the work of the mother let france have good mothers 
and she will have good sons. And now I come to Vladimir Lenin, the architect, one of the architects of the communist revolution in Russia almost exactly a hundred years ago. And as you know, the communists, the Marxists are atheists. So Lenin was definitely an atheist. But he had this cultural understanding. He says, give me a good mother and I will give you a good nation. Hmm? This I didn't get for the internet, this I remembered from many years ago. I can't cite a reference exactly. And then finally, a Spanish proverb. An ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. You know, clergy means religious people. Meaning that the mother is supposed to give all the good religious or spiritual or devotional education to the child. Because the child can go to the church or the temple or whatever, you know, only so often. <coughs> but the mother is with the child practically all the time. So these are some quotes. And naturally this aspect of the mother being the instructor being the one who imparts spiritual knowledge and values to the child is stressed upon in our Vedic scriptures as well. <coughs> we have King Krishab Dev saying, Guru na sasyat, svajano na sasyat, <coughs> pita na sasyat, janani na sasyat, daivam na tatsyat, na pati na sasyat, na mocha ye diha samapeta mrityum. He gives so many categories of people like the guru, the relative, the husband, the wife, the mother, the father, even a demigod, one can't be all of these things unless one delivers one's dependence from the cycle of birth and death. A very, very important responsibility. Again, we have these famous proverbs. This one is from the Upanishads, you know. Uh, <coughs> Matri Devo Bhavo, Pitri Devo Bhavo, etc. Achari Devo Bhavo, Atiti Devo Bhava. Treat the mother, treat the father, treat the guest, you know, treat the Acharya or the teacher as God. <coughs> of course, this is not Mayavad philosophy, but it, it indicates that these are personalities who deserve our utmost respect. So today we see that there is not that much respect given to mothers, not only in general in the society, but the children also, they don't give so much respect to the society. The other day one devotee was just telling me that there was a shocking video that went viral on the internet in, in India, I believe, where one 17-year-old boy was actually beating his mother in Bangalore or somewhere. So naturally this caused so much alarm and everybody was questioning what's happening, yes? <coughs> of course what's happening is that we've lost our devotional and spiritual culture. So all the values that go along with it have been lost. And as Devaki Mataji was saying, then the mother is just reduced to being a cook and a cleaner and that's all. And then everybody just makes demands on her <coughs> and she loses her role as a giver of spiritual and devotional knowledge and culture. <coughs> Also, in, there is a Subhashita, a nice saying that says that the mother is a thousand times more important than the father. In the Narada Pancharatra, it says a hundred times more important than the father. Regardless, whether it's a hundred or a thousand, the point is that the mother is the most important person in the house, in the Grihastha even more important than the father. Srila Prabhupada also emphasized it, as I said earlier, uh, about the child worship and the deity worship. And now I'd like to just tell uh, an interesting, two contrasting stories. One is about this Brahmachari, Iskon Brahmachari, who comes from a family of Madhva Brahmins and very cultured background. And in the from the village in which he was born, uh, sometimes young boys, as young as seven, eight or ten years old, were picked up for sannyas. And they actually took sannyas at, the age, at that age. So when the children took sannyas, of course they went through a whole rigorous routine, astrology and so many other things. So they were given sannyas at seven, eight or ten years of age. <coughs> 
and when the, the boy took sannyas then there would be a grand ceremony in the village and everybody in the village including the elders would come and offer obeisances to this little boy because now he was a sannyasi the so sannyasi is the object of respect from everybody so they would come but there was only one person who is not supposed to offer obeisances to that sannyasi no prizes for guessing who the mother the mother of the sannyasi is not supposed to offer obeisances to the sannyasi rather the sannyasi is supposed to offer obeisances to his mother he may may or may not offer obeisances to other ladies but to his mother he has to offer obeisances and just as others would make way for the sannyasi in part way similarly the sannyasi would have to part way for his mother to go first so this shows that in the vedic culture the mother was given so much importance regardless of whether one was a sannyasi or anything else <coughs> we've come a long way from that and i made a brief reference to how in the modern day world this culture has been so thoroughly lost and i'll give you an example of that from the world outside of india but in any case india is rapidly catching up with all the ills that we're seeing everywhere we're not taking the good qualities from the west in india we're taking all the bad qualities there are so many good qualities to learn but in india people are not learning those good qualities they just pick up the the bad ones so i remember many years ago this was like more than 25 years ago there was a bhagavatam class and the topic the purport had something about mothers now i don't remember so clearly and the speaker was elaborating on that and there was a western brahmachari who was new he had just joined a couple of years ago maybe one or two years ago and then after the class he came up to us and you know he was saying uh you know you're saying the mother should be respected etc but you know how can i how can i respect my mother so what's the problem now please don't get me wrong i'm just citing what he was saying i don't mean to speak it in a demeaning way or in a derogatory way but i'm just speaking the reality of life today he said you know he was in his 20s at that time so his mother must have been obviously at least in her 40s or something he said you know my mother she goes every weekend to the beach and she's in her bikini and she has so many boyfriends i live away from her but she has boyfriends coming in every now and then and she she has multiple boyfriends now how can i how can i respect her you know how, the image that the mother has and you know it is just i can't relate to it and some of the other indian brahmacharis were shocked because they could never in their mind imagine their mother in a bikini or to see that the mother would bring in different men you know different nights and this was something quite shocking to them and uh, so his his dilemma was you know what is this mother idea i i just can't relate to it because he's not been raised in that atmosphere uh, but that was not the case at the time of these gentlemen whose quotes i read out because there was so it's not something that that you know just started out of nowhere it you it, you can see it coincided with the rise of materialism and godlessness in the society even up to 100 years ago there was a strong religious culture even in the west in europe in america and everywhere and therefore these traditions and the mother being what she was and she would have a certain profile where the children would just love her and respect her and therefore you had these big big people the presidents and all that kings who would remember their gratitude to their mother you know obviously it was different their experience was different from the experience of this brahmachari because they had that culture it may not have been krishna conscious in the way we understand it today but sure enough there was a certain strong religious culture there so this is the state of affairs all over the world and it's happening a lot in india as well so i don't think in india anymore we can say that you know well this is indian culture now the modern indian culture is just catching up very rapidly with the worst of what the modern world has to offer uh so these are some thoughts for us that if we revive <coughs> our devotional culture 
uh, and revive the the roles that our different individuals have to play in all the different ashrams. And if everybody plays a role, it's not just that the mothers are not, you know, not, just not just the mother who was doing that. The father was also doing that, and everybody else around was doing that. So we're not just blaming only the mothers, the fathers, the grand, I don't know, whoever else, everybody. So the whole society has degraded to such a degree that these things, people can't relate today. What mother, what, what family are you talking about? They just can't understand it. So there is a great need in our devotee society to establish uh, ideal examples. Um, of what a mother can be and naturally what a good father should be, what a good brother, sister, son, daughter, whatever. All of these are ideal examples that we need to show through our movement. Okay, I've crossed my 20 minutes. So, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. <coughs> I, I definitely would be interested to get those quotes of you, Maharaj. Sure, sure. Yes. Another quote, um, I remember, the hand that rocks the cradle rules, rules the, the world. world. Yes, yes. That's a good one too. <laughs> it was a book by that name. Yes, yes. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, yes please. What, what do you think, what, what, what simple steps do you recommend for us here to somehow start uh, with this, to reintroduce this culture of, of the respect a mother is meant to be given. How, how, what can we do about it? Well, I guess I guess there could be many angles to look at it, but I have a very simple approach, and that is, I'll throw the ball in the court of the men, and say the men should set a good example, and then women will be happy to just do the needful. The state of women's society today is partly, not wholly, but partly very strongly because of the way that men have also acted. And unless that is set right, we can't just have the logic of the half hand or just one half of it working and the other half not doing so. So I think the men have also to set the proper example and then automatically the ladies will appreciate that it will come naturally because it's part of the natural psychology, the natural, the nature like that. But when the men become exploitative and, and, uh, and not uh, r responsible, <coughs> then uh, the women also react. And that's what we see in the world today. And it goes by so many other philosophies and so on. So I think it should begin with the men. <laughs> then automatically, but begin with the men, not in terms of demanding things from the wife or the, you know, you should be a traditional wife, but you should be a good husband as well. You have to, you know, do what you're supposed to do as a Vedic husband rather than just expecting your wife to be a Vedic wife. So if you set the example, then the ladies will follow. Yes, okay. All right. Include, I also would like to share that I had the good fortune of really having had a wonderful mother, even though she uh, was not chanting Hare Krishna, but she definitely was trying her best to plant the seed of bhakti actually in my heart. Yes, yes. I grew up without television. My mother was reading to us every night a story. We were having books in our home. I mean, my parents used so many principles of, sp spiritual principles of child raising, so much more than most devotees do today. Yes. And I definitely can say, I owe my spiritual life to my mother. She gave me that emotional strength and balance and health. Without that, I wouldn't be able to live the life I'm living and, and, and so, um, I definitely can uh, testify that also. Okay, so thank you all very much for coming to this program. I hope it, it I, I'm sure we are all leaving this program with some deep impacts in our hearts and, and we have hopefully all received some more insights in how, how important mothers are on all levels and Yes, please 
Let, I would like to appeal to the ladies, to us ladies, that we have to try and learn how to act as mothers. You know? Meaning, I am last, everybody else is first, no showing off, no sexual vibes, balancing and harmonizing um, a role and being the selfless caregiver. And no matter in what service uh, we are in, we can bring about these, these elements and actually learn to cultivate that mood of motherhood. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Samaveda Bhaktivinda Ki, Gaura Premanandi, Hari 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 Krishna.